I didn't have quite as long to prepare for this talk as I normally do. Uh, I was given a schedule and um, saw that I was on there pretty soon. So I always, as usual, start asking the Lord, what, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to talk about? And uh, several times this um, quote came to my mind. Uh, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the, life, the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Wrong button. So I wouldn't really call this a sermon, um, maybe more like a Bible reading. And um, we're just going to contemplate the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. So I was trying to figure out where to start the talk. And um, I read Matthew 6, 1 and 2. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So this was two days before the Passover, two days before the crucifixion. Um, I was a little confused with the timing of things, but as I was going through it, you got to remember that in Jewish timing, the day starts at sunset. So he was um, crucified on that day. So just a few verses later in uh, Matthew 26, we find Jesus in Bethany at Simon's house. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And I wanted to show you a picture of what it may have looked like to be at Simon the leper's house. And this depiction is quite spacious, so they weren't like a little house where you're cramming people in. Cause, and that's another thing I always thought, where do you pack 12 disciples? Where do you, you know, if I invited them to my house, they'd be all over the place. <laughs> and this is a picture of an alabaster box that belonged to a pharaoh. So I mean, this is what it may have looked like. Um, we see a lot of different depictions, but... Uh, this is one that was from way back when. And they also had a very different way of eating a meal than we do here. They lounged on couches. So this is what it would look like. So if you are imagining in your mind, um, you could see where the woman with the alabaster box would come to his feet. And the people might not necessarily see it at first until they smelled the perfume. But it says, when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. So picture this meeting in your mind. It's after supper, so it's dark outside. And picture Judas kind of casually slipping out the door so he can meet with the chief priests and rulers. What was going through his mind? Um, to contemplate, we don't want to put things there that aren't there, but we know that um, he had just been reprimanded in front of the disciples for displaying his anger for this waste of money. So you knew he was upset. You know that um, he's not a happy man and he's ready to force the hand of Jesus. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, 
Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. In the book of Mark, it says that they were to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. So in your mind, you can picture the disciples seeing this man walking along. And I don't know um, if this was something that men did often back then or if this was a lady's task, but they were to look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And here again in the book of Mark, it goes into greater detail and tells <clears throat> about Jesus saying that the one who dips bread with me uh, is the one who will betray me. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And this is um, a p the pictures I was looking through. This is the Mount of Olives. And it looked like from quite a few of the pictures that Jerusalem was not terribly far away, maybe a few miles. So then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And Jesus said unto himself, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And likewise said all the disciples. So imagine in your mind the proud, self-assured Peter as um, Jesus has made this statement and he is indignant that he would be accused of um, even thinking of denying his Savior. So then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray yonder. And this was in the springtime, so the temperatures were pretty chilly in the evening. And picture in your mind the olive trees and the darkness, and at this time the quietness. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sor sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And in the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, it reads, Every step that the Savior now took was with labored effort. He groaned aloud as though suffering under the pressure of a terrible burden. Yet he refrained from startling his three chosen disciples by a full explanation of the agony which he was to suffer. Twice his companions prevented him from falling to the ground. Jesus felt that he must be still more alone, and he said to the favored three, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. His disciples had never before heard him utter such mournful tones. His frame was convulsed with anguish, and his pale countenance expressed a sorrow past all description. He went a short distance from his disciples, not so far but that they could both see and hear him and fell prostrate with his face prostrate with his face upon the cold ground he was overpowered by a terrible fear that God's, god was removing his presence from him he felt himself being separated from his father by a gulf of sin so broad so black and deep that his spirit shuddered before it he clung convulsively to the cold on feeling ground as if to prevent prevent himself from being drawn further from God the chilling dews of night fell upon his prostrate form but the Redeemer heeded it not from his pale convulsed lips wailed the bitter cry oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as I will but as thou wilt then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, 
Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. These people knew what Jesus looked like, but it was dark and confusing, and so they needed some way to know for sure they were getting the right person. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou, art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Can you imagine the chaos, the noise, and the confusion? And then in the midst of this, Jesus calmly reaches down and takes this ear and puts it back on this man. And yet, Satan has this mob so stirred up into a frenzy that this has absolutely no effect on them. You know, he's, he just did a miracle right in front of them. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that this thus it must be? <clears throat> In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And this account was given by Mark. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples and Judas also which betrayed him knew the place <clears throat> for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples and I thought it was interesting in Mark that um, they crossed over a brook so in your contemplating as you want to make this real because this is real um, they went over a brook to get to where they were going and Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Then answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Oh, thank you. We have little ones down here. <laughs> okay, sometimes that makes it worse instead of better. <clears throat> and Jesus said unto them, I am he. They went backward and fell to the ground. And this again is a miracle. Why would you just go backwards and fall to the ground? Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. If there, therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And it's important to check, this was in John, the different um, Gospels so that you get a more complete story. And they that had laid hold upon Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off 
onto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And then it goes on to tell of how the scribes and the elders and the high priests um, questioned him trying to find something that they could accuse Jesus of that was worthy of death. And now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Peter's cold, and he's confused, and he's afraid. And in his time of weakness, remember they were supposed to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and instead they were sleeping. So he did not get the strength that he needed, and so in his time of weakness, he denies his Lord. And when he was gone out onto the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I don't know the man. <clears throat> and after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So from here Jesus was delivered to Pilate, and it was now morning. And Pilate asked the mob, Who do you want me to release to you? Jesus or Barabbas, and they all screamed for Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. After Pilate questions Jesus and doesn't get any answers, he says to him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? And Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh him a king, speaketh against Caesar. And it was the preparation of the Passover at about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And you can only imagine the evil that is in this mob that um, is yelling for Christ's crucifixion. <clears throat> when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So Pilate had, an, like we talked at our Sabbath school lesson, he had an innocent man scourged and sentenced him to death. And he knew he was innocent. So then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And now I would like to share from the chapter in the Desire of Ages called The, the Crucifixion. Um, the rest of this story because it's just uh, fills in so many details. And it says the Savior's burden was too heavy for him in his weak and suffering condition. 
Since the Passover supper with his disciples, he had taken neither food nor drink, and he had agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane in conflict with satanic agencies. He had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen his disciples forsake him and flee. He had been taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then to Pilate. From Pilate he had been sent to Herod, then sent again to Pilate. And from insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured by the scourge. I can't imagine. Once I can't imagine. All that night there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of a man to the uttermost. Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful farce of a trial, he had borne himself with firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging the cross was laid upon him, Human nature could bear no more. He fell fainting beneath the burden. Jesus was like us. His body was not supernatural. He had the same weaknesses that we did. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Arriving at the place of execution, the prisoners were bound to the instruments of torture. The two thieves wrestled in the hands of those who placed them on the cross. But Jesus made no resistance. The mother of Jesus, supported by John, the beloved disciple, had followed the steps of her son to Calvary. She had seen him fainting under the burden of the cross and had longed to place a supporting hand beneath his wounded head and to bathe that brow which had, which had once been pillowed upon her bosom. But she was not per permitted this mournful privilege. <clears throat> With the disciples, she still cherished the hope that Jesus would manifest his power and deliver himself from his enemies. Again, her heart would sink as she recalled the words in which he had foretold the very scenes that were then taking place. As the thieves were bound to the cross, she looked on with agonizing suspense. Would he who had given life to the dead suffer himself to be crucified? Would the Son of God suffer himself to be thus cruelly slain? Must she give, give up her faith that Jesus was the Messiah? Must she witness his shame and sorrow without even the privilege of ministering to him in distress? And as a mom, these are hard words to imagine because you know what she felt like. She saw his hand stretched upon the cross. The hammer and the nails were brought, and as the spikes were driven through the tender flesh, the heart-stricken disciples bore away from the cruel scene the fainting form of the mother of Jesus. As soon as Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was lifted by strong men and with great violence thrust into the place prepared for it. This caused the most intense agony to the Son of God. The enemies of Jesus vented their rage upon him as he hung upon the cross. Priests, rulers, and scribes join with the mob in mocking the dying Savior. To Jesus in his agony on the cross there came one gleam of comfort. It was the prayer of the penitent, penitent thief. He has heard the words of those who believed in Jesus and followed him, weeping. He has seen and read the title above the Savior's head. He has heard the passers-by repeat it, some with grieving, quivering lips, others with jesting and mockery. The Holy Spirit illuminates his mind, and little by little the chain of evidence is joined together. In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the cross, he sees the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Hope is mingled with anguish in his voice, as the helpless dying soul casts himself upon a dying Savior. Lord, remember he, me, he cries, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Quickly the answer came, soft and melodious, the tone full of love, compassion, and power. The words, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. As the eyes of Jesus wandered over the multitude about him, one figure arrested his attention. 
At the foot of the cross stood his mother, supported by the disciple John. She could not endure to remain away from her son. And John, knowing that the, near was, knowing that the end was near, had brought her again to the cross. In his dying hour, Christ remembered his mother. Looking into her grief-stricken face and then upon John, he said to her, Woman, behold thy son, and then to John, behold thy mother. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. <clears throat> and as a human being, that's hard to understand because of being scourged twice and all the things that he had went through and yet um, his mental agony was that much worse. Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy, mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. And there was darkness over all the land upon, unto the ninth hour. There was no eclipse or other natural cause for this darkness, which was as deep as midnight without moon or stars. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. And as you contemplate that, Please tuck that in your heart and remember that when you're going through trials, that his presence may not be revealed, but that doesn't mean he's not there. Had his glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with him. And at the ninth hour, the darkness lifted from the people, but still enveloped the Savior. It was a symbol of the agony and horror that weighed upon his heart. No eye could pierce the gloom that surrounded the cross, and none could penetrate the deeper gloom that enshrouded the suffering soul of Christ. <clears throat> the angry lightnings seemed to be hurled at him as he hung upon the cross. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes. Those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on ministries of love, spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable agony, anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring it is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death, and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to thee. Suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross, and in clear trumpet-like tones that seemed to resound throughout creation, Jesus cried, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A light encircled the cross, and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head upon his breast and died. 
amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God. Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given to him. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith, he rested in him, who it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his Father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. Amen. And as proof that he was victor, we read in Matthew 27, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of their graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Our, lo our Lord now holds the keys of death and of Hades. I invite you all to spend that thoughtful hour contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. 